Hi and welcome to a new episode of the Compass Podcast. This time we're going to talk in English because we have a guest from the United States. My name is Philip Polan. I'm a chief architect at Compass. And our guest is? Uh, my name is Greg DiMichelli. I'm a director in Google Cloud's office at the CTO and I work for Google. Yeah, and I have two colleagues with me. Yeah, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm working, I'm a developer and currently working primarily on Google Cloud Platform. My name is Ida, and I'm also a developer and also currently working on the Google Cloud Platform. Okay, Greg, what, why uh, are you in Norway today? Uh, well, other than for the lovely weather, mm -hmm. um, actually, it is a beautiful day today in Oslo. Uh, I was here, I gave a keynote at the Subsea Valley Conference, mm -hmm. uh, and the topic, uh, the title of the keynote was called Think Bigger, mm -hmm. uh, Machine Learning and What It Means for You. Yeah. And what I tried to do is I tried to walk people through what machine learning is and to sort of help them give a sense of what it can do. You know, there's a lot of sense that I think some people think that machine learning is really overhyped um, and that, you know, it's much ado about nothing. And we don't believe that at all at Google. Mm -hmm. We think it's incredibly transformative in helping companies go from backwards looking data where you look at what happened and start to do forward looking analytics where you predict what's going to happen, mm -hmm. whether that's predicting a, a maintenance schedule and when a piece of factory equipment needs failure or predicting when a customer is upset and needs some special attention or um, those sorts of things. And so it was, a, it was a talk about trying to encourage companies to think bigger about what machine learning can do. Um, and then we talked about TensorFlow, which is uh, at Google, we've open sourced the fundamental library we use for machine learning. Um, and talked about everything from TensorFlow all the way through to the custom hardware we're doing to make machine learning run really fast. Yeah, because you at Google, you write, you, you create your own hardware uh, yeah. for your data centers. Yeah, who was it? That, is it Alan Kay said that people who love software eventually build their own hardware. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some truth to that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have built custom hardware inside our data centers for years, and we do it for a couple reasons. One is security because if we build the computer and we uh, versus buying pieces we can verify the provenance we know the history of the hardware we know where every piece came from we know it doesn't include anything that it isn't needed we also do it for performance because if you sometimes you can build custom hardware and you can just make it run a lot faster mm -hmm. that was the origin of us building custom network switches mm -hmm. was we needed a faster network so we built our own network hardware uh, and the latest version of that is we have built custom processor chips for machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody knows CPUs, right, for central processing unit. Everybody knows GPUs for graphics. We built a chip we call a TPU, a tensor processing unit that's tuned for TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, tuned for TensorFlow? What, is, what does it make different from a GPU? Sure. Um, if you look inside the math, of machine learning. At its core, it looks a lot like gaming and it looks a lot like 3D rendering. It is um, matrix multiplication. Mm -hmm. And GPUs are reasonably good at that, but TPUs tend to have much bigger requirements for memory bandwidth and, and connections to data beyond the chip. So um, it is at its heart a very, very efficient matrix multiplying unit mm -hmm. with some very custom circuits around to make sure we can feed the data to the chip at high speed mm -hmm. uh, uh, consistently. Mm -hmm. The first version of our TPUs were optimized for the prediction process. Let me step back. Uh, machine learning, there's sort of two phases. There's the training, so that's the teaching it what to do, and then there's the prediction where you give it a data point and it predicts. So think of that as for for vision. The training process is showing it millions of pictures and teaching it, that's a cat, that's a dog. The prediction process is you hand it a picture it's never seen before and you say, what is it? And it predicts, that's a car. So our first phase of TPUs was focused on the prediction part. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, every time somebody on their phone says, okay, Google, and talks to their phone, that's a machine learning process we run. Uh, and Jeff Dean, who's one of our senior, most senior engineers, he did some back of the envelope math and he realized that 
if everybody talked to their phone for three minutes, Google would run out of computers. Mm -hmm. like we wouldn't have enough hardware in our, all of our data centers put together to deal with that. So that's when we started this journey of, okay, how do we, if regular hardware is not fast enough, how do we do custom hardware? So the first phase was focused on that prediction part. The second generation of TPUs that are out now uh, add the training part so that you can not only make the predictions faster, you can make the training faster. And that's really important because one of the powerful things about machine learning is that it can improve over time. You know, most systems, you write an application tomorrow, a week later, it's the same application that you wrote. It doesn't get better over time just by running a lot of data on it. What's special about machine learning is you can start to build a system that actually improves over time. It can get better the more training that you give it. That means the faster you can train it, the more often you can train it, the more you can update it, the better it can get. So do you have any managed systems with doing the updating of the models? So, so kind of like personalized models for, for persons? And yeah, persons. yeah that's, that's a great point because um, there's sort of two ways to think about machine learning. One is, um, you can build your own models and train your own models using your own data. You know, you're an oil and gas company, you've got data on when particular equipment is likely to fail. That's data knowledge you have, you build a model and you just use Google as a toolkit, an infrastructure provider. The other way you can do it is you can just use somebody else's model that's already built. In our case at Google, we build models for vision, speech, video, text, translation. Basically, most of the services that you've used as a consumer, whether it's Google Photos or, or Google Translate, are available as an API. So you can just be a Python or a JavaScript or a Java developer and just call an API. The latest step, though, is sort of a blending of the two, where you take our vision API, for example, which already knows how to spot general purpose items, and you can just augment it, customize it with your specific domain knowledge. So imagine you're a auto manufacturer and you want to be able to look at uh, parts going by on a line and you want to be able to spot a transmission versus a differential. Google's vision API out of the box doesn't know about car parts, right? But you can easily augment it so you can extend our model with your bit of custom data, and that takes very, very little development. It's literally, you create some folders, you put example pictures in the folders, and you say train, and everything else is handled automatically. You don't have to understand TensorFlow. So with this, uh, this extension, would that be publicly available? Or yep, be yep, we call it AutoML, uh, and the first AutoML service that's out now is for vision, is to take our, is to build custom image recognition of your own data types without having to um, start from scratch with building a, you know, a computer vision API. Literally, you can, with as little as, I think it's about 100 examples of each type that you want to recognize, um, you can train a system. And literally, it's like you go into cloud storage, you make a bucket, you name it, you put examples of the image that you want to train in that bucket, and you run the system and it will train on those data using the name of the bucket as the thing it should recognize. Uh, there's some great tutorials on that have been used to do things like recognize different types of flowers, and it, it, it's you, you can play with this today. So I guess what's really exciting about ML is we're, we're in a place where we're taking it from something where you have to be a PhD data scientist to do and turning it into something where an app developer can do, and I think that's, that's pretty exciting. So when you, you have a picture of a glass of water mm -hmm. and you put it in there, do you do um, do you manipulate the picture to get the different kinds like upside down and it turns on the left side? Or do the developer have, have to do that themselves? Uh, no, you don't have to do that. I think I'd have to. I, have, I don't know that I've personally tried it with uh, you know every variation. Machine learning is the ultimate <clears throat> garbage in, garbage out mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. So you do need to think about: Do I have a representative set of examples, um, and and do those examples are they really representative of what I expect it to see? Yeah. That is an important just with machine learning in general. Um, you know, I think about uh, you have to think through selecting not just the quantity of data, um, but the quality of data. And by quality, I mean 
the representation of the data, make sure it really is what you expect it to see in production. So samples should be the, the same kind of data that you would yeah, it, put into the... It, exactly. It's like, you know, if, if, um, if you took uh, OK Google and you suddenly spoke Klingon to it and we never trained it on Klingon, what are the chances it's going to recognize Klingon? Pretty, pretty low. Uh, now, it turns out Klingon is a language we support in Google Translate, I will point out, because yes, we are that nerdy. Um, uh, but, but in general, the notion of representative data is really important. In a previous podcast, we talked about AI and chess. Mm -hmm. um, you have uh, AlphaZero Go. Yes. Was it based on TPUs, or was that one of the things that... Yeah. No, the, the, alpha, the first AlphaGo... Uh, TPUs were used in the first AlphaGo in the game match with Lee Sedol. Mm -hmm. uh, for folks who don't know, AlphaGo was a system developed by Google to play the game of Go. Um, Go is um, radically more complicated than chess. In chess, you can brute force. Mm -hmm. you literally, you can calculate every possible move. Then from there, you can calculate every possible move. And then from there, every possible move. And at any point, it's possible to look at the board and numerically calculate who's ahead. So that means you can just brute force it. Go is very different. First of all, the number of possible moves is explosively large. There's more possible board positions in the game of Go than there are atoms in the known universe. Um, but equally important, there's no algorithmic way to look at a board and know who's ahead. If you, if you show a board to 10 Go grandmasters and you ask who's ahead and how much, they'll all give you a very subjective sort of answer. Well, I think black's a little bit ahead. Why? And you get a very, now they're, I mean, they're right. It's not like they're making this up, um, but it, it, there's no known way to calculate a good versus a bad position. So all those things mean the traditional algorithms just don't work. So the machine learning system was trained to um, play against uh, records uh, the, the world's best players. Um, and over time, it developed a sense of what is a good play and a bad play. And in fact, famously in the third or fourth match, uh, AlphaGo made a move that all the commentators just, and the AlphaGo team itself thought was like a bug or something. Mm -hmm. It was a move nobody had ever expected to be made. Um, I highly recommend, by the way, on Netflix, there's a documentary about AlphaGo. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. You don't have to be an ML or a PhD expert. It's very approachable, but it's very, uh, it talks a lot about the development and the team and Lisa Dole himself. Um, so anyway, that took us a couple years to train AlphaGo uh, and it was running on TPUs. Mm -hmm. And then we decided um, DeepMind is a part of Google um, to sort of take it one level and the next level and they introduced AlphaGo Zero. And AlphaGo Zero didn't play other people. It played AlphaGo, and it played itself. Um, and so AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol four matches, four games to one. Within a few days of AlphaGo Zero, it was beating AlphaGo 100 matches to zero. Um, so you can get these incredible exponential growth, um, and TPUs were essential to that, that whole process. Um, yeah, because they bring you so much processing power to Exactly. A TPU, we, the TPUs are built into pods. Um, a pod of TPUs, which is, um, I don't remember how many TPUs, I think it's 24 TPUs. Uh, that may not be the right number. But it delivers 11 and a half petaflops of compute power. That's uh, it's a phenomenal amount of, of computing power in a compact unit. And what's more impressive is its TPUs are 15 to 30 times faster than a conventional chip. But more importantly, from our perspective, they're 30 to 80 times faster per watt of power. Mm -hmm. And the one thing you learn about data centers is power is king. Um, the amount of hardware you can put in a data center is almost entirely limited by power consumption. Um, uh, and so if you, because power generates heat, heat has to be dissipated. So if you can get more compute power per watt, you can put more compute power uh, in a data center. Uh, another way to think about it is if you think about Moore's Law and the pace at which CPUs get faster, uh, TPUs are like a seven-year leap in terms of uh, the number of generations of Moore's Law that, that you get. So 
by any measure, they're pretty powerful. Um, and for customers, they show up in a couple ways. One is when you use our services, many of our services are powered by TPUs behind the scenes. Um, we now have available in pre-release TPUs for customers that you can attach to a VM on GCE. So really you have a choice. You can run on CPUs, that's the cheapest option, and it gets you one level of performance. You can put GPUs on your VMs and you can run them that way, and that's sort of another level of performance or you can attach TPUs. And it's really it kind of depends on the business need, right? What is it? What mm -hmm. is it you're doing? Are you are you doing seismic analysis for an oil and gas where you know you you need to make a decision immediately, um, or where the monetary value is so high that it's worth having a faster answer, yeah. or is it more of a background process where you're looking at historical data to to get some results? And frankly, if it runs in six hours or 24 hours, you don't really care. So it's really a kind of a business decision how much acceleration you you want. What's the next thing for CPUs, GPUs, GPUs? Uh, are you investigating quantum computing? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think the single biggest, at the fundamental layer, disruption uh, that's coming along is absolutely is quantum computing and, and for those who don't know quantum computing um, and I, 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 I have to every time sort of wrap my head around it again because it is so non-intuitive to those of us who live in Newtonian physics um, <laughs> which is near I know is all of us um, unlike a classical computer where a bit is either zero or one a, a quantum computer uses a, it can be many values at once. It's a superposition of multiple quantum states um, into what are called qubits. And uh, to, to, there's been this dream from a long time of creating a computer, like we would recognize as a computer that you can program, um, that would operate not on ones and zeros, but on qubits. Um, to do this, you have to operate these devices at millikelvins of temperature, so they're incredibly incredible cold superconductivity temperatures. And there's a point that is described as quantum supremacy, which is the point at which it is demonstrated that a quantum computer is faster than a classical computer on a certain well-defined problem. There's a well-defined problem that's been spec'd out. And we're not there yet. We're not at a point where anybody has a quantum computer that is verifiably faster than a classical computer. Um, but we're getting closer and closer and closer. We just announced uh, uh, a research paper on a project we call Bristlecone, which is a quantum computer that we've developed um, that is getting, we believe, uh, much closer. Mm -hmm. um, our first quantum computer was measured in terms of qubits as the, 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 the size, if you will, the equivalent of like a 32-bit computer, 64-bit computer. Our first one that we talked about was a nine qubit computer. Um, it's generally thought that a hundred qubits somewhere around the line is where you get quantum supremacy. Uh, we just did a research paper uh, where we announced um, a 72 bit, 72 qubit quantum computer. Um, we'll go a little bit in the weeds here, but, but we believe it's not just about the number of qubits, it's also about reading the data. Turns out, the physics is very strange mm -hmm. in these in these devices, and so reading the data off of it in an error-free way is as important as actually the things. If the thing is calculated an answer, but you can't reliably read it, if you read it a hundred times and you get a different answer five of those times, that's a problem. So we're focused on both increasing the capacity of quantum computing, get the error rates down, then you can get quantum supremacy sooner mm. than just by scaling up the yeah. size of the unit. Yeah. Um, I do think this is potentially quite um, quite transformative. Specifically, initially, I think people always ask, so what's this good for? Um, the initial use cases are almost, I should say almost entirely, the initial use cases are quite interesting in terms of a lot of simulating of physical processes, um, chemistry in particular companies in producing plastics and any sort of chemical products, understanding the behavior of, of molecular chemistry 
they will take every bit of compute capacity they can get. They were the people who bought supercomputers, you know, for their data centers back in the 70s. They're the people today who buy every GPU that any vendor will sell them. Uh, because literally, there is no way to solve the complete solution for their problem with the compute capacity we have. So chemical industries, uh, any sort of simulation of the physical world is uh, a, a good primary example. Think of seismic simulations. Think about car crash simulations. That's, I think, where the initial interest is. Um, uh, and I think it's where there's a lot of, a lot of potential. Uh, but there's a lot of work that has to happen, mm -hmm. not just work at the physics level, but also work at the programming level. Mm -hmm. Like, again, those of us who, uh, you know, we are, we are Newtonian people. Our brains evolved to be very good at understanding classical physics, because if a ball was coming at your head, being able to intuitively know to duck was an evolutionary value. We, we, we developed no evolutionary value in understanding quantum physics because it didn't make a difference in whether you <laughs> lived or died, right? Yeah. So it shouldn't be surprising, as my colleague Kevin Kissel on the CTO office says, it shouldn't be surprising that we have no intuition for this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and so programming these systems is going to be, I think, um, quite a challenge even when quantum supremacy is demonstrated. But, uh, but it's coming. I mean, yeah. there in my career, uh, we will have some form of quantum computing that is being used in production by some companies, I believe. Yeah. Speaking of work, uh, we're doing work in the now, not in the future. Talk a little about the future, mm -hmm. but that's not uh, how we earn uh, right. uh, our bread right now. Uh, Maybe we should talk about the, the kind. Of, why why would anybody want to use the, your cloud platform today? Yeah, um, I mean, I think uh, I think there's sort of three ways that we um, that we think about um, about cloud. Um, one is on just the infrastructure itself. If you think about it, when you go to a cloud provider, you're you're taking something that used to be your responsibility, maintaining your servers, maintaining your infrastructure, running cables, and you're making it somebody else's problem. So you want to do the diligence to know that, that you're going to make it somebody else's problem, somebody who specializes in it, right? And in, in many ways, we have been a pri building a private cloud since 1998 when Google was started. So we talked a lot about companies about things like security and how moving to Google Cloud can help you be more secure. Uh, yes, how you can save money and all those sorts of things, but I think even more importantly, how you can, as a company, focus mm -hmm. because you can stop doing things that don't make you a better company. I mean, the, the joke line I mentioned is, you know, great job maintaining our DNS entries, said no CEO ever, mm -hmm. right? Why should that be something you spend your precious time on? Mm -hmm. So that's one sort of set of reasons, which is that We've been building infrastructure for 19 years. We think, although it doesn't differentiate you, it does differentiate us. Yeah, because Ida and like some of the work in project, and like Ida, she works in a project with five, six people. Yes. How many infrastructure people are working on the project? Zero. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But you're a developer. What yeah. you, you want to write code for a living, right? That's what yeah. makes you happy and gets you excited in life. I, absolutely. Parts, so. I yeah. completely agree. The only thing is that Andreas has to tune yeah. maybe the app engine. You have to find the, yeah. the correct settings. The correct yeah. settings. Yeah. But right. that's the difficult Something right. you do and then it goes for a month or two and then. But okay, it's not a full time to... job. Right. No. Exactly. And that's and that's the point is, you 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 hire people to write software for you. So hmm. let them write software and get them out of the business of patching servers and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, like hmm. patching the operating system of the server, that's, that's not something. That's not value. Yeah. That doesn't differentiate and you. That's something you don't want to do. You haven't done it yes. a single time. We, we ran our services in Kubernetes and we started the project. and. Uh, and we shifted to App Engine because we thought it was too much work to use Kubernetes opposed, as opposed to, yeah. to App Engine. Yeah. Well, an App Engine is a great example of um, uh, that sort of scale story, right? Which is what I always think 
a lot of people in App Engine focus on the big number, which is um, uh, the number of requests it can handle. But I think the real power is the scale to zero part, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. If there's no traffic, then literally your application scales to zero, it doesn't run, it costs you zero. And there's so many applications out there that are very cyclical and bursty. Think about a corporate application for Google just finished is finishing up our internal performance review where we all write our accomplishments for the year. That application gets zero use until one month before performance reviews, and then it gets incredible use. Mm -hmm. And many corporate applications have this sort of lot of use, zero use, lot of use, zero use. That's really hard to provision for. Yeah, you um, can do the traditional way of service being there for that's running all the time. 60, 70 percent of the right. time idle. Yeah. yeah, and think about marketing. Think about uh, a company doing marketing for the World Cup or for Eurovision. For 11 months out of the year, there's nobody looking at your Eurovision app. Um, for a month, an entire continent is looking at your Eurovision app or World Cup. So there's also a lot of public facing cases where uh, that's, that's valuable. Or as you said, there's just the I'm a developer, I just want to write code. And what really amazed me was how easy it was to go from Kubernetes to App Engine because we used uh, Flexible. Mm -hmm. And then you can just deploy the Docker images that you use for Kubernetes. Yep. You can just deploy them yep. App Engine Flexible. People don't realize that you know, at Google, everything runs in a container. Uh, and I quite literally, I mean everything. Uh, when you run a GCE VM, that v your operating system is running in a VM, which is running in a container. Like we run everything on our infrastructure in containers. And App Engine has been container based from the beginning. Now it wasn't Docker based because App Engine predated Docker, but it made it easy for us to adapt it to be Docker based so that you could take your Docker containers and manage them that way. So yeah, I, um, uh, I think that's, that's uh, a classic example. And, and the second thing that we talk a lot about is, is data mm -hmm. and insights. I mean, um, I often say that as people, you know, we've become digital pack rats. Like, I don't know about you, do you delete photos? No. Do you delete emails? Delete yeah. photos from my phone. Yes. Well, when I actually take a picture of my shoe or something, yeah. right? <laughs> um, like we don't delete anything, um, and it's not just us as people; it's us as companies. We have server logs that just explode. We have web logs. We have customer histories. We have, you know, take your pick. Um, and so the real problem I think that companies face today is, it used to be the problem is how do I manage all that data? And you'd get a robotic tape archive and some crazy machine that moved tapes around with robotic arms. Well, now you can store data in the cloud for a penny a gigabyte. So like, why would you why would you bother with that? But now the problem is there's got to be value in that data, and there is. But how do you find the signal inside all of the noise? Um, and so again, that's a journey we've. Uh, you know, we've been on a Google. If you think about Google search, what is Google search but finding value in a very large data set, the data set being the entire World Wide Web. So a lot of technology that we originally built uh, is in use today in the form of Hadoop, came out of MapReduce, which was an early research paper we produced. Um, and so we think we can help companies make sense out of data because in many ways, our infrastructure, although it's used for many purposes by Google itself, including serving web traffic and Google Docs and Gmail, at its heart, our infrastructure has really been tuned for data and analytics, because that is what search is. We actually pipe our request logs from App Engine into BigQuery, mm -hmm. and then we use uh, Google uh, Cloud Data Lab, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to create reports. Yeah. Yeah, so we can see statistics about usage. Yeah, we we are Google itself is we are massive users of BigQuery. I, I don't think Google could exist if BigQuery didn't exist. We, you know, we like you. We we look through server logs. We look through just almost every data we we work with. We share BigQuery queries with each other. You know, hey, this is interesting data. Did you see what this does? And like you, then we build charts and dashboards and graphs. Our our our, our SRE team, our reliability engineering team, you know, they live on BigQuery for spotting anomalies when there's incidences. So, um, so yeah, I think another reason people come to us, in addition to just if you're going to outsource your infrastructure, do it to somebody who you know really specializes mm -hmm. in it. 
And the second one is all about understanding the value of data. Mm. And the third one is what kind of what we touched on with App Engine, which is letting your developers just develop. Yeah. Um, was it uh, James Governor from Red Monk said, uh, the only sustainable advantage in an era of unprecedented change is unleashing engineering talent. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a long sentence, but I think it's really deep in the sense that, you know, waves come and go and business trends come and go. But in this world, your, your developers, your engineers are not just your IT cost center that you're trying to manage. They're actually the ones creating the innovation in many ways. They're, they're either creating the products you're offering to your consumers or they're creating the analytics for you to understand your business. So, you know, I think unleashing developers so that they can un use their full creativity to drive your business um, is sort of the third reason. And again, look at Google. We have tens of thousands of developers. We are, you know, very heavily indexed on software developers. Uh, and so we've built a lot of software specifically around trying to let our developers just write code and not have to hassle with yeah. all those other pieces. That's also what we see with our customers, that they want to uh, innovate mm -hmm. uh, and that they, they understand that you can't just continue your old way of working. You yeah. have to do new stuff and at least develop a new thing. Yep. Make sure that your yep. uh, employees can do things mm -hmm. in a new way, not yeah. faster way. And in this era, new things that means in some form software. Yeah. Right? Even yeah. if you're building a physical product, it's software that lets you design, develop, ship, deploy, monitor, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, um, yeah. And it, we even go further than just using App Engine, so we don't have to patch operating mm -hmm. system. We even built a serverless thing. Like yeah, yeah, App Engine is yeah. serverless. Yeah. No, sort of, yeah. But, no, absolutely. That, that whole notion of um, there will be a time in the not too distant future when any developer, and you tell them, well, back when I was starting, we used to provision a virtual machine and we'd specify how many RAMs, how much RAM and how many cores. Like, like even that is rapidly becoming a level of why do I want to do that? And you see that Kubernetes tries to do that, right? Don't think about a server, think about a whole cluster of computers and let the system take your little job and figure out where to slot it. Again, that's how we develop at Google. No Google developer thinks about the server their application runs on. It's kind of a just an odd question. But ironically, that creates a new problem because you say nobody deletes data anymore, but yeah. then you have GDPR yeah. that requires you to delete data after a certain time, yes. keep it within a certain region. Yep, uh, absolutely. And I think um, uh, the whole subject doesn't come up just in Europe, but in general, the question of data locality and how do I control where data is stored. And I think the answer to that from our perspective is really to give you the controls. Mm -hmm. So if you look at sort of the whole set of products we have, we have some products which are inherently very local. When you run a VM, it's running in the Belgian data center. And that VM and its persistent disk are in the Belgian data center. So it's inherently local. Um, some services uh, are regional. So you say, or, or configurable to be either regional or global. So Google Cloud Storage, you can store data and you can say, EMEA only, it's a regional bucket. Or if you're trying to do disaster recovery, you can say, no, no, I want this global, in which case we will replicate copies globally so that in the event even of massive disaster, um, your data still exists and is still accessible because it's replicated somewhere else. And so it really is a matter of you knowing your business and your data and, and configuring that right that matches your requirements. And it's our job to give you the tools to be able to do that because it, there's not a, even within companies in EMEA, there's not a one size fits all. There's customer data that has to be treated one way, but then there's other data that's not customer, not PII, and it has a different set of options available. So our goal there is really to give you the flexibility to figure out, um, figure out what's the right option for your specific use case. And again, I, the one thing I would say is there's, there's not any one size fits all. Another thing, if you start working on GCP, uh, customers are often afraid for the locking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can say something like, as a developer, do you feel you're writing specific 
Google code or is it just Java code and Java people that you actually don't even care that much? Uh, mostly, uh, primarily we, we write code that's could run anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but then sometimes we interact with managed services mm -hmm. from Google like uh, storage, uh, mm -hmm. um, data store. Uh, that, that would kind of lock you in mm -hmm. a bit from, from that side. Yeah, I think, um, I think when people think about lock-in, um, the mistake is to think it, that it's a binary state. You're locked in or you're not locked in. Mm -hmm. It's a range and it's mostly about, um, I think about it sort of like if it's insurance. Um, if you literally want zero lock-in, then the option is use no operating system but Linux, use no dialect of SQL, developed past 1972, no, so it, it's a silly thing, it's yeah. so limited. Yeah. So the question is about this balance between how much freedom and control do you want to move between services and um, how much native capability do you want, and we believe you should be in control of that. So we do that in a couple ways. One is um, we open source some key technologies like Kubernetes, like TensorFlow. They can literally be run anywhere. They were designed from the ground up to be open source and run on any cloud. Um, and that's uh, and that's why I really encourage people looking at containers in any form. Really, Kubernetes should be your starting point because then you really are in control. You can run it on us, even with our managed service, but it's still Kubernetes. You can run it on Amazon, you can run it on Azure, you can run it on-prem. Um, then there's those cases where Google has a particular you know, proprietary technology that can't be replicated outside our data centers. And we do have some of those where the technology isn't possible without the petabit per second bandwidth that we have in our data centers. Um, and in that case, what we do is we try to put open APIs on top of them. Um, so, for example, Bigtable is uh, one of our NoSQL databases. It has, um, when we brought it to market externally with Google Cloud, we put an HBase API on top. So that means even though it's this proprietary high-performance product underneath, you're in control. You want to replace that layer and you want to move it to another platform, you can replace it with HBase yeah. and your application will continue to function. Uh, Cloud Storage has an S3 compatible API. So if you want to maintain agnostic, you can write an application that talks to S3 or Cloud Storage. So a lot of it is about deciding how much value does this particular managed service provide? Does it have an open API on top? And then you can sort of make a decision that says the value of that is so high that, that I'm going to I'm going to use it, or you can say, no, you know what, I'm just going to stick with Kubernetes because then I don't have to worry about uh, about anything and I, I have control. But really, the fundamental premise is that you should be in control of where, of where your applications run. Um, and that's just sort of the framework of how we think about it. Open source core technology so that they run anywhere. Whenever possible, put open APIs even then on top of Google's own proprietary systems. Um, and then also don't do financial lock-ins. Like don't require people to do prepaid three-year reservations where you pay everything up front and if you change your mind, sorry, you prepaid. Yeah. So it's sort of that three-part system. Uh, I, I want everybody in the world to use Google Cloud, of course. Yeah, sure, but, I but, yeah, but. but what I what I, I want that by every month that customer saying, I'm happy with Google and I want to keep staying with them. I don't want to be in a situation where somebody is unhappy and just sticks with us because they're stuck. That's what happened in the 90s with some big database vendors and some other stuff. That's not the model we want to replicate. Cloud should about cloud should free us up not just from managing infrastructure, but it should free us up from that stuff too. There, you know, the pricing model is quite nice as well because the if you have a data flow that takes 10 hours on one yeah. computer engine, you can run it in 10 computer engines and it's roughly yeah. the same price. Well, and data flow is another example where we took Apache Beam. We took the, the programming model that drives data flow. We open sourced it via the Apache Foundation. So again, you can do a data flow job and you can replace data flow underneath with you know Spark and those sorts of things. And again, there are different performance characteristics. I've 
I, I like to think that, you know, running it on data flow has a lot of performance advantages, but again, you still have, you have the insurance that if something changes, you are, you're in control. And I think that's, um, I think that's the way to think about it. Not in a binary, am I locked in or am I not locked in? Are you in control? Mm -hmm. And are you able to choose the amount of work that you think is acceptable? Like if you're unhappy, do you want to be able to move cloud providers in a day? in a month, in three months, in six months, mm. like those would drive very different decision making. Know that if you say you're gonna switch in a day, that's gonna drive a very restrictive set of choices. And maybe that's maybe that's right. Maybe if your business has exactly the right choice, but maybe three months. Like maybe you, that's a good level for you to think that if I'm unhappy, I wanna be able to switch in three months. That then opens up a different set of possibilities yeah. in a conversation. Okay. So it's not binary, it's, it's you thinking about I'm in control, what's the level of time frame that I'm comfortable with being able to move this application somewhere else? Uh, I still remember when you needed a queue in the project, you lit almost literally had to pick straws between the project members who got the shortest straw. I was so fortunate to have to set up the queue solution yeah. and now you just set up a pub sub. Uh, instance and just run it up. Set, set it up to just create yeah. a topic exactly and, and off you go and, and, and sure go. That, that's locking into google but it's so easy to set it up <clears throat> yeah and and, it. and again you yeah. could set up a you know a rabbit mq or yeah. other thing if you wanted to yeah, but it's not a massive i mean but but no but you don't want to invest that energy it's right. so easy to set well it goes up back whatever. to the yeah divesting mm. part too right your company is not differentiated by your ability to set up message queues yeah. <laughs> right it just so has to work. It just has to work, exactly. But you are differentiated by your ability to understand data and data pipelines, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, building the application yep. on top of your yep. infrastructure. Yep. On that note, maybe that's a good one to close. Great. Thank you for the talk. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you for having me to your office and to, to Oslo and Norway. And yeah. We make sure to invite you again during the summer. That <laughs> would be lovely. Yeah. That would be lovely. I, I keep saying that. I keep getting invited to come, but they only, I've only been invited between December and March. And, you know, is it me? You no, know? No. Yeah, we have to fix that. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Okay. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.